This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about the famous lasker noether theorem. So just before stating this, I just recall some notation. So M is going to be a finitely generated module over a Noetherian ring R. And we recall that co-primary for a module M means um, M has at most one associated prime. And the theorem we're about to prove um, says that if we've got any finitely generated module, then M is contained in a direct sum of modules MP, where the sum is over associated primes um, of M. And each module MP is going to be co-primary with only one associated prime, which is, of course, the, the, the prime P. Well, um, before giving this theorem, I want to explain what a primary module is. So we can ask, you know, we've, we've got these co-primary modules. So obviously there should be something called a primary module. And the answer is very simple. There is no such thing as a primary module. Um, the terminology in this area has got completely messed up for various historical reasons. And I will now explain why the terminology has been messed up by giving you a little bit of the history of the subject. So I'm going to go through three different versions of the lasker noether theorem. And by looking at these, you'll see why we've ended up with this funny term co-primary for something that really ought to be called primary. So the original version says that if I is an ideal of a ring R, then I is a finite intersection of primary ideals. So although there isn't a primary module, there's a perfectly good notion of a primary ideal. So you remember primary means that if X, Y is in the ideal J, then X is in J or Y to the N is in J for some integer N. So this version of the theorem was proved by Lasker for polynomial rings over fields or the integers. And um, then Emmy Noether generalized it to all, all Noetherian rings. Um, well, another version of the Lasker Noether theorem generalizes it from ideals to modules. So version two says the following. Suppose we've got modules N contained in M. So these are both R modules. As usual, we assume they're finitely generated. Then version two says that N is a finite intersection of primary submodules. Okay, well, you're thinking to yourself that I announced a couple of minutes ago that there is no such thing as a primary module, and now all of a sudden I'm talking about primary submodules. So what's going on? Well, the answer is I put this word sub in, and there is a notion of primary submodule, but there's no notion of a primary module. So um, in order to understand this, I better actually give you the definition of a primary submodule. So X is called a primary submodule of, of M if Rm in X implies M is in X or R to the N big M is contained in X for some N greater than zero. Here R is in R and M is in M, of course. And the first thing you notice is this is not a terribly memorable definition. Um, um, next thing you notice is that if M is the ring R, then a submodule is just an ideal, and this just becomes Lasker's definition. So this is essentially Lasker's definition of a primary submodule, except I don't think Lasker ever actually talked about modules. Um, the next thing you notice is that this is not actually a property of the module X. 
It's the property of the way X is embedded into the module M. In fact, it's really a property of the quotient M over X. And let's call this quotient Y. So what this says is that if uh, R is a zero divisor of Y, this means um, R Y equals naught for some Y not equal to zero, then um, R to the N Y is equal to naught for some n greater than zero. Um, so this property of a module y um, is, we, we, if y has this property, we say y is co-primary. Well, if you have been paying attention, you will have alertly noticed that I've now given two completely def different definitions of what is meant by a co-primary module. So earlier, I said that y was co-primary if one associated prime, and now I'm saying it's co-primary if it's got this weird, somewhat technical condition. Well, we're soon going to sort this out by showing that for finitely generated modules, the two definitions are equivalent. But before doing that, let's just give the third version of the Lasker-Nurter theorem. So the third version says that M is contained in a product of um, co-primary ideals. So let's see why this is more or less the same as the second version. So to show the second version implies the third version, what we do is we just take n equals zero. And um, by the second version, we can put naught is the intersection of JP, where this is primary um, submodule. Well, what this means is the natural map from M to the product of M over JP is injective because the kernel is just the intersection of all these ideals here. And now, um, although this is a primary submodule, um, this whole thing here is a co-primary module. Um, so you see the second version involving um, um, sub-modules and modules is unnecessarily complicated. We're talking about two modules, and really you don't need to talk about two modules at all. All you need to do is to talk about one module, which is the quotient module. And similarly, the definition of things being primary is a bit silly because you're talking about two modules and all you really need is their quotient, which is just one module. So the clean version of the Lasker-Nurter theorem ignores primary um, modules, primary submodules completely and just uses co-primary modules. Well, now we should get back to a problem we mentioned earlier, which is that I've managed to come up with two apparently totally different definitions of a co-primary um, module. So, so here are the two definitions of co-primary. The first definition says there is at most one associated prime. And the second definition says that Rm equals naught implies m equals naught for r to the n m equals naught for n greater than zero, some n greater than zero. So we should check that these two conditions are the same. And as always, this lecture M is finitely generated over a notarian ring. So let's show that two implies one. Let's suppose M is non-zero and M is some element of the module M. And let's put P to be the annihilator of M. And we're not assuming P is prime yet, so this might not be an associated prime. But if P is in the annihilator of little M, then by condition two, if you decipher it, this implies that P is contained in the radical of the annihilator of M.
Um, that's more or less just a rephrasing of condition two. So let's note that in green so that we can see it later. Now let's assume P is prime. If P is prime, then we notice that the annihilator of M is contained in the annihilator of little m, which is the element, um, which is equal to P by assumption. Um, so the radical of the annihilator of M is contained in P as P is prime. So um, let's mark this condition in green. And if you compare these two conditions, you'll see that if P is prime and is the annihilator of some element of M, in other words, if P is an associated prime of M, then P is equal to the radical of the annihilator of M. Um, so um, there is at most one associated prime, And we, as a sort of extra bonus, we found out what the associated prime is. It's, it can be given as the radical of the annihilator of the whole module M. So next we um, want to show that condition one implies condition two. Um, well, we can assume that the annihilator of M is equal to zero because if the annihilator of m isn't zero we just quotient out the ring by it and carry on as before so let's put p is the only associated prime of m and this contains the annihilator of m whenever m is not zero. And the reason for this is that all maximal elements of this form are associated primes of M. And since there's only one associated prime of M, it must contain all of these. So we just need to show that P is nil potent because condition two just says that if something annihilates some element of M, then some power of it um, has to be in the annihilator of M, which is zero. Um, so showing that P is nil potent is more or less equivalent to showing condition two holds. So suppose some A in P is not nil potent. If every A in P is nil potent, then the idea of P is nil potent because it's finitely generated, of course. Then um, the localization M A to the one minus one is non-zero. And this follows because if X in M A to the minus one equals zero, um, um, sorry, if, um, and so, sorry, I should have said, if X in M is zero, in m a to the minus one, this means x a to the n is equal to zero for some n. So m a to the minus one equals naught implies a to the, the, the n is in the annihilator of m because for some n, because it kills some power of a kills any particular element of m and M is finitely generated, and the annihilator of M is naught by assumption, so A would have to be nil potent, which it isn't. So this module here is non-zero. Um, next, we see that since M A to the minus one is not zero, its set of associated primes is also not empty. So these are primes of, of 
the localized ring R a to the minus one, of course. So we pick some prime T that's an associated prime of M a to the minus one. Um, so this is an ideal of R a to the minus one. And now we let Q be the inverse image of T in R. So we just recall we've got a map from R to R a to the minus one, and we've got an ideal T here, and we're just taking its inverse image Q um, here. Um, and these are both primes, because T is prime because it's an associated prime, and Q is the inverse image of T. And Q, you can check, is the union of all the ideals. We can take the annihilator of M, which is contained in the annihilator of MA, which is contained in the annihilator of MA squared, and so on. And you can see that from the definition that Q is everything which annihilates M times some power of A. This is an increasing sequence of a notarian ring. So the union must be equal to the annihilator of M A to the N for some N, because eventually this sequence becomes constant. So Q is an associated prime of um, M because it's the annihilator of some element of M and it's also a prime ideal. But we notice that A is in P and A is not in Q. I mean, we assumed A was in P and it's not in Q because A is a unit of M A to the minus one. And if A were in Q, then, then this would be zero. So P is not equal to Q because of this. So M has at least two associated primes. Well, this contradicts the, our assumption uh, that M has only one associated prime. So we see that if there's only one associated prime, then Lasker's condition for being co-primary holds. Um, okay, now we get to the proof of the lasker nurter theorem. So this is, says that every um, finitely generated module M over a notarian ring is contained in a finite product of co-primary ideals. And the proof of this is actually embarrassingly trivial. As I mentioned, Lasker's original proof of this was 100 pages of really hard calculations in elimination theory and so on. But um, by using the correct definition, so we use the, the definition, we, we, we do this thing for notarian rings rather than polynomial rings, and we use a definition of co-primary, which is much easier than Lasker's. So our definition says that something is co-primary if there's only one associated prime. The proof becomes amazingly easier. So, um, so the proof, if not true, let's pick a maximal submodule N so that M over N is not um, contained in uh, a product of co-primary ideals. Yes, that should be a finite product. And we may as well assume that n equals zero just by quotienting out by n. And we're going to get a contradiction. Um, first of all, we notice that m is not co-primary. Because if it were co-primary, then it would obviously be contained in a product of co-primary ideals, in other words, itself. So um, it has two submodules, M1 isomorphic to R over P1 and M2 
isomorphic to R over P2, where P1 is not equal to P2, and these are both primes. Um, and now we notice the annihilator of x for x not equal to 0 in this module is equal to p1, because r over p1 is an integral domain, and the annihilator of any element of an integral domain is just 0. And similarly, we see the annihilator of x, any element x in here, that's non-zero, is p2. And p1 is not equal to p2. And from these two facts, and the fact that p1 is not equal to p2, we see that m1 intersection m2 is just zero, because anything in M1 intersection M2, its annihilator has to be P1 and has to be P2, unless it's zero, but P1 isn't equal to P2. Um, so now we look at the following exact sequence. We take M1 intersect M2, maps to M, goes to M over M1, plus m over m2. So this is an exact sequence which holds for any two submodules. We can map m to the sum of two modules and the kernel would be the intersection. Well, we've just said the intersection here is just zero. So this map is injective. Moreover, um, we picked, we, we're assuming that zero is the maximal submodule that's not a product of co-primary ideals. So each of these two modules is contained in a product, finite product of co-primaries. So now we've found that M is a submodule of this module, these two modules, and each of these two modules is contained in a product of co-primaries. So M must be contained in a product of co-primaries. So we've reached a contradiction by assuming that it wasn't. So that's the end of the proof of the Lasker Nerta theorem. As you see, it's you know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's about ten lines long, give or take a line or two, which is a so it's a reduction of the complexity of the proof of a factor of maybe a thousand or something. And I sort of look at things like that and you wonder, you know, what's going to happen in a hundred years? Are, are the proofs we have now that take hundreds of pages going to look equally trivial in another century? Or are they really that hard? I mean, what's going to happen to the classification of finite simple groups, which is 20,000 pages long. Are we going to have a 10 page proof of it in another century? Um, probably not, but given what happened with the Lasker Nerta theorem, who knows? So let's just finish by showing that the Lasker Nerta theorem in the form we've given it really does imply Lasker Nerta's original form. So here we're just going to take M to be the quotient of R by an ideal I. So the form we have says that. R over I, which is equal to M, must be contained in a product of co-primary ideals. And these co-primary ideals, sorry, co-primary modules. And these co-primary modules are all going to be quotients of R. I mean, we can just replace them by the image of R otherwise. So they're all of the form R over I P for some ideal. And we know these modules must be co-primary. Well, if the whole module is co-primary, then it means the ideal here must be primary in Lasker's sense. So we've got a map from R over I to um, as a submodule of a product of R over I P's. And you can immediately see that this implies that I must be the intersection of these ideals I P. So the original version of the Lasker Nerta theorem. Um, really is a special case of this theorem for modules.